Here's a brand new atheism debate with Dan Barker and Trent Horn. I didn't know debates like these were still happening, but here it is. But Dan is right that if God had to traverse an infinite number of thoughts, he could never get anything done. Similarly, if time had to traverse an infinite number of events before today, then today would never happen. Both Dan and Trent are wrong here. As Bertrand Russell said, there's no problem with an infinite regress because there's no logical problem with a series with no first term. Also, this view is predicated upon assuming the A theory of time is true. That's the theory that says that each moment in time is contingent upon every preceding moment. This view is not consistent with relativity, which shows that some events which are sequential from some frames of reference are simultaneous from other frames of reference, and therefore all points in time equally occupy reality. Reality. The reality of any particular moment is not contingent upon preceding moments, because all moments are equally real. This is called the B theory of time. And be uncaused, or the argument starts all over again. It must be all powerful because it made something from nothing. How does that follow? How can you reasonably infer that since something has this one power, it therefore has all powers? The latter of which can't cause anything. Therefore, the cause of the universe's beginning must be an immaterial, eternal, all-powerful agent, or what most people call God. But now let me share two arguments which show God exists even if the universe has always existed. The argument from motion. Things change. That's obvious. And change is just the reduction of a potential to an actual. For example, a train car can potentially go down a track, but that potential to move can only be actualized by something else, pulling the car down the track. This is obsolete Aristotelian metaphysics, which is contradicted by what we currently know about physics. Aristotle believed that if something is moving, it must be constantly propelled by something else. What we've known since Newton, however, is that an object in motion will stay in motion all on its own, and its potential to move from one location to another does not need to be actualized by something else. If it were to stop or to change speed or direction, that would require outside intervention. But motion itself has no such requirement. Folks often ask me to make a video about Edward Fazer. He's an apologist who frequently uses this argument. It's scientifically illiterate. As best we can tell, the universe as a whole has never been in a state of rest. If it never changed from a state of rest to a state of motion, there doesn't need to be anything to put it into motion. And whatever is pulling the car has to be pulled by something else, because nothing can actualize its own potential. Yes, it does. Any more than it could create itself from nothing. But maybe the universe's motion and change have existed forever. That would be like saying a train car is moving because an infinite number of cars is pulling it. Which, given the fact that the B theory of time is true and there's no logical problem with an infinite regress, is an entirely reasonable concept. Or that a paintbrush could paint by itself as long as it had an infinitely long handle. An infinite series of movers doesn't explain why there's any motion at all, be it in a train, or a universe. If there was never a time when an object in motion was ever at rest, then there's no need for any explanation for that motion. It is not dependent upon any external propulsion. And even if it did, how would energy for that propulsion come from something non-physical? The train only moves because of something that gives motion, but doesn't receive it, like a locomotive. No, an object in motion will stay in motion. That motion does not need to be given by anything if the object in motion was never at rest at any time. It must be all powerful because there is no potential act it can't perform. It must be all knowing because it provides actual existence to potential properties and relations between objects, which are the basic elements of knowledge. Finally, this cause has to be all good because evil is just a lack of good, and the ultimate cause has no potentials or deficiencies. If that's the case, then how can evil exist? If evil is just an absence of goodness and therefore an absence of God, then either this God has not actualized his potential to overcome evil, and is therefore not purely actualized, or he has no potential to overcome it. An infinite, necessary, immaterial, timeless, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good being is what me people mean by the word God. But what does any of that self-contradictory stuff mean? The argument from existence. Why is there something rather than nothing? There are only three explanations for why the universe exists at all. It exists for no reason, the universe is necessary, or it has to exist, 
Or three, the universe is explained by something that is not the universe. Number one doesn't work because if things could exist for no reason, then we would expect to see objects like cats or Chryslers popping into existence all the time for no reason. Non sequitur. Even if the universe does exist for no reason, that doesn't mean that things can enter it for no reason, or that we should expect them to do so. Number two doesn't work because the universe is not necessary. You might ask why a triangle is lime green, but you wouldn't ask why it's three-sided. A triangle just has to be three-sided. But the question, why does the universe exist, isn't like asking, why is a triangle three-sided? The answer isn't obvious because the universe doesn't have to exist. It just does exist. The same is true of literally any concept. As David Hume pointed out, anything that can be thought of as existing can be thought of as not existing. There isn't anything that exists by logical necessity. But how do we know this God is the Christian God? What if the cause, this cause is the God of another religion? The gods of ancient mythologies are limited in existence, goodness, power, and knowledge. So they can't be the true God. The true God could only be the God of classical monotheism, like Islam, Judaism, or Christianity. But if Jesus rose from the dead, then this shows the God of Christianity exists, because other religions deny Jesus rose from the dead. How does that logically follow? Even if we had sufficient reason to believe that Jesus rose from the dead, that wouldn't mean that he's a god or the son of a god, or that he had any abnormal ability other than the ability to rise from the dead. As Christopher Hitchens said, even if Jesus did rise from the dead, that wouldn't prove that his father was a god, or that his mother was a virgin, or that anything he said was true. Antony Flew, who was at one time one of the most famous atheists in the 20th century, said the evidence for the resurrection is better than for claimed miracles in any other religion. Not true. The Gospels were not eyewitness accounts. And even if they were, we couldn't speak to those eyewitnesses today. However, the followers of the Indian guru Satya Sai Baba are still alive and will give you first-hand accounts of the miracles they say they saw this guy perform. If we have sufficient evidence to believe that Jesus performed miracles, then we have sufficient evidence, in fact stronger evidence, to believe that Satya Sai Baba performed miracles. It's outstandingly different in quality and quantity. Yes, the reports of Christ's miracles are vastly inferior both in quantity and quality to the reports of Sai Baba's miracles. Even radical skeptics do not deny that Paul knew the apostles and described in 1 Corinthians 15 how both individuals and groups of people, as well as skeptics like himself, saw Jesus after his death. In addition, these first Christians believed Jesus rose from the dead in a Jewish society that believed dead messiahs were failed imposters who, along with everyone else, would not rise until the end of the world. The reason they believe this is because the prophecies about the Messiah in the Old Testament contradict what we are told happened to Jesus. Nonetheless, Christians believe that Jesus is the Messiah prophesied by the Old Testament. I've always found it weird that apologists want us to believe both that Jesus contradicted these prophecies and simultaneously fulfilled them. The best explanation for why Jesus' disciples preached Jesus' bodily resurrection in defiance of these cultural norms was because it really happened. That they believed it really happened might be the best explanation, but since mistaken beliefs about people rising from the dead are far more common than actual resurrections, that the followers of Jesus mistakenly believed that he resurrected is the vastly more probable explanation. But perhaps the apostles merely had a grief-induced hallucination. That's what Dan suggests in his writings. But there are four reasons that count against this hypothesis. One, groups of people saw Jesus and groups of people don't have the exact same hallucination. They don't have to have the exact same hallucination. They only need to all agree that they saw Jesus. And the reason that multiple people don't have the exact same hallucination in every detail is that such a thing would be improbable. But it wouldn't be miraculous. It wouldn't be altogether impossible like, say, someone rising from the dead. 2. Paul was a persecutor of the church, so he would not have had any grief over the death of Jesus from which to hallucinate. Grief is not the only cause of hallucination. 3. Jesus was buried in Jerusalem. The apostles could check his tomb to see if he really was dead, and the authorities could trot out his corpse in order to quash this new religious movement. I think it's unlikely that Jesus was buried at all. He was crucified, and as Bart Ehrman has pointed out, the whole point of crucifixion was to humiliate the victim. Allowing Jesus to have a decent burial would defeat the entire purpose of crucifying him. 
Four, the apostles did check, and the tomb was empty. The gospel's descriptions of women discovering the empty tomb is a detail that is so embarrassing in a patriarchal society that its inclusion in the narrative only makes sense if that is just what really happened. What's even more embarrassing is that the Gospel of Mark says, Overcome with terror and dread, they fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. If the women said nothing to anyone about this, then how did the author of the Gospel of Mark find out about it? God is definitely a reality beyond our experience. So it's not surprising the Bible represents God coming down to our level and using simple, non-literal descriptions of himself so that ancient people could understand him. That means God's anger refers to how our sin separates us from God, and God's jealousy refers to how he is like a husband who is zealous to protect his wife. The Hebrew word rendered jealous, or kana, even means zeal. It also means that descriptions of God lifting up skirts or making people eat their children aren't literal. They reflect a developing theology that did not distinguish between God directly causing evil and merely permitting it to happen and so it was often conflated. That means God is not, as Dan says, a sadomasochistic, misogynistic bully. Moreover, the non-literal language can be seen in the alleged commands that Israel wipe out or utterly destroy the Canaanites. King Merneptah of Egypt used similar language to describe the complete destruction of Israel even though Israel continued to exist for centuries after that point. You say that as though there was absolutely no way for this supposedly all-powerful God to make himself any clearer in his revelations and scriptures. Horn is another one of those apologists who expects us to believe that the supposedly infallible word of God was written down by somebody with the communication skills of a Mississippi truck stop glory hole. Finally, Dan says God is capriciously malevolent or cruel and cites how God made Job suffer for no reason. But the point of this story about Job is to refute the common ancient belief that bad things only happen to bad people. Given how easy it is to interpret that story as Yahweh being a dick to win a bet, it's not a very well composed parable. But if Dan is right, then the accidental universe we live in is what is truly capricious or arbitrary. Richard Dawkins even said the universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. Yeah, but that's not a problem for atheists, because atheists don't claim that benevolence is a necessary characteristic of a godless universe. The indifference of a godless universe is not evidence that the universe is godless. Ironically, Dan's views on the Bible open the door for one more argument that proves God exists. I'm sure Dan wouldn't change his belief about the Bible, even if every other human being did. But this shows morality isn't determined by society. It shows that Dan's morality is not determined by society. But if moral facts transcend society, then what are they? The fact that Dan's morality isn't, or at least isn't, completely determined by society does not mean that it transcends society. On the contrary, it would be completely consistent with the idea that morality is unique to each individual. So let me be clear, difficult passages in the Bible do not refute my arguments for the existence of God or the historical evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. No, difficult passages only refute the idea that Yahweh or the scribes through which he communicates have better communication skills than a styrofoam lobster from a New England gift shop. But look at it this way. Jesus trusted the Old Testament as divine revelation. And if a man can walk out of his own tomb and vindicate his claim to being the infinite God who created everything, then I'm going to put my faith not only in him, I'll put my faith in the church he established and the Bible it gave us. And that faith is not blind, it is trust based on evidence you can see I've clearly laid out tonight that shows the Christian God exists. If I saw a dude who was just crucified get up and walk out of his tomb, and I was able to determine somehow that this was not some kind of trick, I would make a beeline to the nearest psych ward. Why would that not be a reasonable thing to do? Why would that not in fact be the most reasonable thing to do? But if God exists, why are we debating at all? Why does God need arguments? Why does he need proofs? Why not reveal himself or herself to me directly? Is he too weak to speak for himself? He needs somebody like Trent to explain it to us? This very debate is one evidence against the existence of God. 
Sometimes apologists will say that the existence of God is obvious. They cite Romans 1.20, which says that the evidence for God is so clear that people who don't believe in him are without excuse. If that's the case, then why are there non-believers? Why does anybody fail to believe in a God if its existence is so obvious? Apologists will then sometimes claim that we actually do believe in God and are just denying his existence because we want to sin. But if that's the case, then what's the point of making arguments? You use arguments to convince somebody of something that they don't believe. There's no point in making arguments to someone who's just denying something that they do in fact believe. Many definitions of God contain mutually exclusive characteristics such as omniscience versus omnipotence or omnipotence versus omnibenevolence or free will versus omniscience. I discussed the free will argument for the non-existence of God, FANG, in my book Free Will Explained. If you know the future, you cannot have free will. Another issue with free will that's theologically problematic is the dichotomy between determinism and chance. If something isn't determined, then by definition it's a chance event. If a god's actions are not determined by anything, then how are they any more than whims? If they are constrained by his nature, which by the way is why apologists say that he can't commit evil, then such a god does not have complete free will. Then there's a lack of agreement among believers about the nature and the moral principles of God. Paul said, let there be no division among you. Yet the religions of the world, especially Christianity, are hopelessly fractured into divisive camps. Sunnis and Shias, Protestants and Catholics, they're killing each other over these trivial, irrelevant doctrinal differences. Paul also said, God is not the author of confusion. But can you think of a single book that's caused more confusion than the Bible? You believers should first get your act together before you come talk to us non-believers. If it really were the case that there is a transcendent moral standard and the Bible is where you can find it, you would expect that there would be a lot more agreement among followers of the Bible about what it is. However, the degree of moral disagreement that you see is actually much more consistent with the idea that people do not have access to some transcendent objective moral standard. God is capriciously malevolent. There's Job with his friends. Here is the most damning verse in the entire Bible, Job 2, 3. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? You incited me against him to destroy him for no reason. God confessed that he tortured a good man and killed his children for no reason. That's his words. That should earn a conviction of first degree murder and mayhem, and yet you believers worship this God. Even if the point of the story of Job was to show that the fact that bad things happen to a person doesn't mean they're a bad person, it seems to explain the occurrence of these bad things by saying that Yahweh is pretty easy to manipulate. It seems pretty counterintuitive to say the least that a perfect all-powerful God would portray himself this way. Even if this story isn't meant to be taken literally. If Yahweh being manipulated is meant to be some sort of allegory, I have absolutely no idea what this allegory is meant to represent. Also, claims about metaphor are unfalsifiable. One could dismiss any evidence that one finds in the Bible against Yahweh's benevolence as being metaphorical, and there would conveniently be no way to demonstrate otherwise. Those are just metaphorical. If those are just figures of speech, then the whole Bible could be a metaphorical figure of speech. God himself could just be a metaphorical figure of speech too. We don't even have to take anything seriously in the Bible if we can't take it at face value. We all know when Jesus said, I am the door, we don't look for hinges in the doorknob. We all know that. But in these verses that I cite to you, the context is important and it shows that I am indeed quoting the God himself. If the story of Job can be taken as a metaphor, why not the story of the resurrection? How do you discern the absurd biblical claims which are metaphorical from the absurd biblical claims which are literal? Uh, lack of a coherent definition of God. Well, Dan must have an idea of what God is, otherwise he wouldn't know what he doesn't believe in. If I told you that this thing called the Glorbax existed, would you believe me automatically, even if you had no idea what a Glorbax is? Or would you withhold belief in the Glorbax until you understood what it was and could then discern whether it does or does not in fact exist? It is entirely reasonable to not believe that a proposition is true if you have no idea what that proposition is saying. Um, a spirit can't exist because it's only defined by what it's not. Well, that means there's no atheists because atheists are defined by what they don't believe in. 
Uh, if an atheist is a person who lacks a belief in God, then a spirit is a person who lacks a physical body. Then how do you define a person? I would define a person as any system that carries out the activities of conscious self-awareness. How can such activities be carried out if there's no body of any kind to carry them out? A person without a body seems like a contradiction to me. Some basic elements of reality, like quarks or strings and spirits, are unobservable and not made of smaller elements. They're not unobservable like spirits are unobservable. We can observe effects that are most parsimoniously explained by the existence of quarks. We have seen no effects that can be most parsimoniously explained by the existence of spirits. God can't be free because he knows the future. God is free, nothing outside of him determines his actions. He could have created a different world, he simply chose not to do that. When you say that nothing outside of him determines his actions, does that mean that you think his actions are internally determined? Unless you're a compatibilist, which is a kind of determinist, that doesn't really count as free. And again, if it is the case that your God's actions are completely undetermined, then those actions are chance whims. And he's perfect, so God won't change his mind. I'm sorry, but Dan's fang argument is all barker and no bite. Uh, lack of an answer to the problem of evil. Look, as long as God can bring more good from any evil that exists, God and evil are not logically incompatible. Since I would consider a God that ensures absolute goodness to be better than a God that ensures merely net goodness, I don't think the God of the Bible is a perfectly moral being. Uh, Dan has the burden of proving God could never have a good reason to allow evil to exist because he's the one making the argument. We can think of good reasons. God allows moral evil so we can have free will and be able to truly choose the good. How would undetermined and therefore chance whim decisions be truly choosing the good rather than decisions to choose the good which are caused by deterministic causal reasons? Uh, lack of obvious evidence. Why are we even debating this? Well, just as God can allow evil in order to preserve greater goods like free will, uh, in action, God can allow non-belief in order to preserve greater goods like free will in belief towards him. Why would that be a greater good? And how do we have free will to believe in anything? If you presented me with a convincing argument for a god, I don't know how I would be able to help but believe it. If, for example, you presented me with a valid syllogism with premises I believed, I wouldn't even know how to not believe that the conclusion is true. Belief is not voluntary. In other words, God has good reasons to not be obvious and allow non-belief. He might want us to act without always thinking he's right over our shoulders. But don't you believe that he is actually always right over our shoulders? And wouldn't hiding that fact be deceptive? 